The age of Capablanca and Lasker marked the end of an era dominated by the West. A revolution was on its way, which would change the face of the game. When Lenin brought communism to old Russia, he promised sport, culture and education for the masses. Chess incorporated all three. The Soviet leaders attacked what they called the degrading of chess under the corrupt influence of the Western European bourgeois café. With a five-year plan for chess, the game would be politicised and purified. There would be shot brigades of chess players to bring it to the masses. And the masses responded with great enthusiasm. In the Soviet Union, chess was becoming as popular as football. When Capablanca visited Moscow in 1935, he was astounded at the progress their chess had made. Both in numbers and strength, the Soviet Union was well on the way towards becoming the greatest chess-playing nation on Earth. In a simultaneous display, Capablanca won less than half his games, and by that time, he'd already lost his world title. The main goal of Soviet chess was to defeat the man who'd replaced him. Since 1927, the world champion had been Alexander Alekhine, himself a Russian, but a good czarist who'd fled after the revolution. The Soviets described Alekhine as a fascist renegade, but in fact he had no interest in politics. Alekhine loved women, cats, alcohol, and above all, chess. The Dutchman Max Erver won the title in 1935 from Alekhine, who seemed to be in a drunken haze, but Alekhine sobered up enough to regain the title two years later. And then in 1946, Alekhine died, and Mikhail Botvinnik won the tournament to find a new champion. The Soviet production line had started. Mikhail Botvinnik was not yet world champion when he began training replacements. This is not surprising. He began exactly the same way at the school children's Palace of Pioneers, and then came many tournaments and many victories. When Maestro Kmoch congratulated the young player on victory, he hardly thought that he was congratulating the future world champion. Fifteen years later, in the same hall, Grandmaster Erwe shook the hand of this new chess king. This was the last time a foreigner took part in this ceremony. Subsequently, Botvinnik congratulated Smyslov, and Smyslov congratulated Botvinnik. Then, Botvinnik congratulated Tal. A year later, Tal again congratulated Botvinnik, who relinquished the crown to Tigran Petrosyan. Only recently, the young Soviet grandmaster Boris Pasky stormed the chess heights. True, he was unsuccessful. Still, the chess crown remained in the Soviet Union. In 1969, Spassky finally did manage to take the title from Petrosian. He was the fifth consecutive Soviet world champion. Among them, they'd held the world title for nearly 20 years. 